on, guys? Ben Brewster here with TreadAthletics.com, and we're here for episode three of our Q&A series. Uh, the whole point of this series is to provide you guys as much value as possible and be able to interact with you guys and answer your specific questions in a little bit more depth than you might get on a one or two sentence uh, answer on Instagram or something like that. So really want to be able to dive a little deeper with some of your questions and kind of, uh, kind of roll through this. And I'm sure if one of you guys has this question, a lot of you guys are going to have the question as well. So um, any questions uh, for future episodes, you can leave those in the comments below or just make sure to keep following us on Twitter and Instagram at Tread Athletics and Tread underscore Athletics uh, for Instagram. We are going to be posting the, uh, the place to submit your questions there the day or two before we film these episodes. So keep an eye out for that. But let's just straight up get into it and go through these questions one at a time. So Peyton Henry, uh, he asked, uh, my mountain velo is higher than my pull down velo. Uh, tips slash mechanics to improve pull downs. Uh, now I think this is looking at it a little bit backwards. I don't think that's necessarily the right question to ask uh, because generally uh, if your mountain velo is higher than your pull down velo, that's, that's not really a problem. Uh, pull downs are a drill, it's, it's a way to hopefully transfer and improve your mountain velo. Um, so I've seen guys in the past that were maybe 88, 90 off the mound and they had kind of awkward footwork or maybe they weren't the most athletic guys. And so their pull downs were maybe 88, 89. And so they just didn't have a bump on their pull downs. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say this means your pull downs suck. It could also mean that you're just really efficient at using the mound. Um, it could also just mean that your pull downs suck and that you're not used to it and that you don't have good footwork yet. Um, so a lot of times, if you were specifically trying to, like if you, let's say you were an outfielder and you were trying to specifically train your pull downs, um, I would tell you to first off, break up and slow down the movement first. So take that full 30 or 40 foot running pull down that has all these moving parts and break that down into just a one step pull down. So step into, then push off that, that and basically pull yourself forward with the curl hop, with that landing leg, with the, with the lead leg, and then land on the back leg and throw. Try to simplify it as much as possible with one step pull downs first. Then you, from there you can go into two step pull downs. And then from there you can go into uh, longer pull downs if that's your goal. But honestly, with a lot of our athletes, we don't even use full pull downs uh, because it just, it becomes a lot of moving parts and a lot of excess momentum that you can't really transfer into, you, know, you can't really transfer to the mound anyway. Uh, so if a guy's pull downs are 15 higher than he would ever throw off the mound. I don't really see that as being beneficial if you can't transfer it. Um, so really one or two step pull downs and then just working on the footwork. It, it does take a little bit of time if you just started uh, to sometimes feel that. And then you also might experiment with turn and burns. Uh, turn and burns are gonna give you a little bit more of that counter rotation feel uh, and makes it a little bit easier for some guys to be able to separate the pelvis from the upper half uh, when they do turn and burns, which is, if you're not familiar with that, it's just backpedaling and firing, uh, you know, starting facing away from your target. Uh, so that would be my answer. It's not really a problem, though. It could just mean you're very efficient off the mound. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Colber05 asks, what do you think about bracing the core? Uh, this is a very vague question, so I guess I'm just going gonna, gonna to answer it how I want. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what he means by this. I'm assuming he's talking about in the throwing motion. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the purpose of the core in the throwing motion? Um, but bracing the core in general. So let's first talk about what a good core brace is and when that would be appropriate to actively uh, focus on and use it. And then what actually happens in the throwing motion, how the core functions and rotational movements and do those two things carry over. So uh, when we talk about a good core brace, usually we're referring to something like uh, a front plank, a back squat, a deadlift, some sort of movement where you're about to handle a lot of compressive or sheer loading and you need to make that spinal column as rigid as possible by using the breathing uh, to engage the, uh, the core musculature, the rectus abdominis, obliques, everything in your core, uh, using, using breathing to basically reinforce that, that whole spinal column before you deal with a ton of compressive loading like in a 400 pound back squat or shear loading like in a 400 pound RDL, uh, something like that. So the way that you would do that is essentially think about breathing into your diaphragm, breathing into your belly as opposed to breathing up into your lungs. So you shouldn't get a ton of, of chest movement during, those, during your breathing. You should think about expanding into your diaphragm 
Um, you can put both hands on your sides and squeeze. Think about like holding a big, uh, like a big hamburger. And as you inhale through your, through your belly, you should feel it expanding that ring in three dimensions. So it's not just breathing through your belly front to back, it's breathing into all around all quadrants of that diaphragm and expanding outwards. And you'd hold that essentially during the squat rep, during the deadlift rep, during whatever you're doing uh, for you know one or two reps in the weight room. So that's where uh, you know baseball players will kind of sometimes look, or strength and conditioning coaches for baseball will sometimes look towards what powerlifters do and try to apply that to baseball players. Uh, that's an effective way of uh, getting powerlifters to lift more weight and possibly getting baseball players to lift more weight in a safer way in the weight room in some of these movements. Uh, but that's not really what we're trying to accomplish uh, when it actually comes to creating as much power as possible in a rotational movement. In a punch, in a kick, in a throw, you're not trying to keep the spinal column as one rigid pole as you rotate, or you'd be really unable to segment everything. You'd be rotating as kind of a stiff board as you rotate. Uh, I would encourage you to look up the spinal engine mechanism. Uh, Grakovetsky talked about essentially the, uh, the nature of how the pelvis and the torso, uh, they rotate, or you know, thoracic spine and the pelvis work uh, synergistically in opposition to each other. So there's, there's figure eights that happen with every step, with every, you know, every step, either running, walking, throwing a punch. Um, they need to work in opposition to each other. Uh, I would also look up David Weck, uh, his coiling core mechanism. It's, it's essentially a training system and how he kind of teaches this pattern off of the spinal engine theory. Um, so when it comes to bracing the core, you shouldn't be actively trying to brace the core when you throw, when you hit, when you kick, when you punch. Um, it's much more of being able to dissociate the pelvis from the torso and feel that all connect into a rotational, uh, a rotational plane of energy. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, did my best to, uh, to go after that one. Joey Bats 412 says, best ways to get the arm on time and in a good position at foot strike. I will link to a, a, a video that I posted several months ago at an athlete who, I still actually work with this athlete, and his arm was way down at landing. Um, you know, it was not even close to on time. And what we did is we used uh, figure eight drills, which is using a initial uh, counter movement of the throwing arm to help that arm swing up into position. And then we also used an Indian club routine to reinforce that position and really encourage his arm to get up on time. And he made incredible progress in about a 30 minute session, just working through some of these drills. And he's been able to maintain, uh, maintain that pattern and over the last several months, gradually transfer that from these drills to his actual throwing delivery. So um, I will post a link to that in the description so you can kind of see the sequence and that whole backwards training progression that we use with him. Uh, that would be the first place I would go if your arm is late or down at landing or not, not in shoulder plane, is some sort of flowing figure eight pattern uh, you know, with like a one pound implement, whether it's a plyo ball or an Indian club. Do some of this low level patterning, low, low speed patterning uh, at kind of low intensities uh, just to kind of feel the arm on time before you let the shoulders go. So feeling that arm get up, uh, we use the cue of patient torso or patient, patient shoulder rotation because a lot of times before the arm actually gets up, the athlete wants to just immediately yank from the shoulders. So patient torso, let the arm actually spiral all the way up and then go with the torso. So starting off a little bit slower, making sure that you're able to get into some of these positions first and using the heavier implements uh, to, cue, to cue that and over-exaggerate that. And then as you build up speed in the movements and get more confident in the movements, go back down to a baseball, you know, within range of a baseball weight, four to six ounces, uh, and begin to build up the arm speed and the, the intensity in those drills. All right, Ty Abel asks, how would you address an athlete with scoliosis in the lower six vertebrae? Uh, so, you know, again, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a doctor. This isn't about diagnosing or giving you a rehab prescription. Uh, but as a strength conditioning coach, if I were to st still be trying to increase your lower body power, uh, still be, you know, still trying to uh, maybe hypertrophy the glutes, quads, hamstrings, and, and all that, I would be looking for ways to avoid 
extreme compressive or shear loading on your lower back. Um, so I would be using things like belt squats. Uh, I have an article that I'll link below on how to set up a belt squat to be able to still go heavy and do it very safely, uh, even if you don't have access to a belt squat uh, machine. So if you don't have that, uh, you can check out the article below on how to do belt squats. I would be using sled drags, so heavy sled variations with a belt rather than with handles. Again, you're bypassing the, the, the lumbar spine. You're still able to load the legs very, very heavy. You're still able to get a ton out of that. I do a ton of those myself. I would be using glute ham raise variations, which uh, you can do a lot of those without having to add a ton of weight through your back and still crush the glutes and hamstrings that way. Um, so those are some of the go-tos that I would still use. Uh, but depending on if you're symptomatic or it's just uh, you know, a diagnosed condition, um, I would definitely check with your, with your doctor or therapist what you're able to handle from a compressive loading standpoint before you just go and crush back squats, crush deadlifts, uh, crush anything that's going to be putting a ton of stress through that spine because, again, with scoliosis, you're not dealing with as much, uh, you don't have as much stability in that, uh, in that spinal column because you're dealing with an abnormal, uh, abnormal curvature there. So uh, that's my answer there. Obviously, do your own research and consult your own doctor about what you are cleared to do but bypassing the, the lumbar spine is fairly easy to do and still get a training effect. Uh, Zayad 1103 asks, uh, the biggest mobility issues in high school pitchers that stop them from gaining velo? Uh, the two biggest ones that we consistently see are uh, limited scap retraction and horizontal abduction. So not being able to open up the chest and let that arm uh, basically pendulum swing back behind the midline of the body. A lot of this tends to come from a history of barbell bench press. Uh, almost every two-way player we see that has played high school football, uh, you know, they've all got his, they've all got months or years of bench press and typically incorrect bench press form under their belt. Uh, without fail, 100% of them have some sort of uh, limitation, whether it's a minor limitation or a major limitation. I mean, we're talking guys who have put on 40 pounds, they've tr doubled their strength over the past couple years, and their velo has gone down or stayed exactly the same as their strength has shot up. And you look at how they used to throw when they were maybe 13 and how they threw at 16, and their arm just doesn't work. Their arm doesn't get back as far. They're missing layback. But specifically, as the pec minor gets shortened, as the pec major, uh, which is the intro rotator and horizontal adductor, as all of this gets short, anteriorly tilts your scap, adducts your humerus, and uh, internally rotates your, your humerus. As you basically get locked in this position, this is the exact opposite of what we need as a thrower. So we need to be able to get that scap into retraction, posterior tilt, and we need the uh, humerus to be able to get into external rotation. So as a thrower, we need the exact opposite of that. So I'm not saying it's not important to still train the pressing musculature. We use full range dumbbell bench press movements. We still load those heavy, but we do it intelligently. Uh, we do a ton of push-up variations where your scaps are free to actually move and protract around your rib cage, which they're not in only doing bench press variations. Um, and so that's, uh, that's one way we, we address it in the weight room. But then more specifically, once you've actually already built up a mobility restriction there, a ton of uh, soft tissue modalities, just to make that tissue as pliable as possible and free up a lot of this range. Sometimes we'll add in some you know, FRC uh, methods, some static stretching, some active stretching methods uh, alongside the tissue work to open that up. So we have a ton of these, uh, a ton of these different uh, movement prescriptions that we'll do for guys after we've assessed them and seen if that's an issue for them. So this, the, the pec is a big one. And then the other, the other big one I'll touch on here is, uh, is thoracic rotation. Um, I wouldn't say there's necessarily one specific exercise that uh, leads to losing thoracic rotation. Um, but again, it's extremely important if you're going to separate the pelvis from the thoracic spine or the hips from the shoulders um, and actually segment your delivery properly, that you have both good arm side thoracic rotation on, at, the landing, at the landing position, but also glove side thoracic rotation <coughs> when it comes to the follow through to be able to act. act to be able to effectively get into your follow through and let that energy unwind through pronation, internal rotation, protraction, and then from there to finish the follow through where the arm doesn't slam across the body, you need thoracic rotation to actually finish the follow through position. So both ways, you need your T-spine to be mobile and opened up. Um, 
I personally am looking for about 70 degrees of thoracic rotation as kind of the baseline. Uh, there's definitely a genetic component there, but we're looking for about 70 degrees. 90 degrees is, is what a lot of professional guys have, but uh, 70 degrees is kind of a realistic uh, place to shoot for for a lot of guys. Uh, Mason Bus 21 asks, when training in the off season, do you do a lot of mobility uh, to keep flexibility? Uh, first off, distinction between flexibility and mobility, uh, because I, I don't think uh, I don't think it was necessarily clear here. Uh, flexibility is your range of motion, but just kind of passively. So if I was just going to stand and bend over and do a hamstring stretch and just kind of hang out there, it's whatever range my particular joint, in this case my hip, hip flexion would be, you know, a hamstring stretch. It's just the, the passive range that your joint has. Mobility refers to being able to move through positions. What is the active range that that joint actually has? So those two are, are they're definitely correlated, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have active control of that range just because you can lay on your back and somebody can stretch your leg into that range uh, on its own. So mobility really is the key is, you know, when it comes to athletic performance, we don't want to just do a ton of static stretching. Uh, we're trying to uh, do more active stretches or active mobility work or tissue work um, to keep and maintain control of those new ranges that we're trying to get. Um, but essentially, yes, the answer is we do do a lot of mobility work, but it depends on what you need. Just like an athlete who asks, like, what supplement should I take? The answer is whatever you're deficient in. You don't, you don't need to take vitamin D if your vitamin D levels are fine, but if they're not fine, you probably need to take vitamin D. It's the same thing when it comes to mobility. I mean, there's dozens of different potential restrictions or limited joint ranges of motion that you might have. You don't know until you get an assessment what those are, and you don't know what you should be prescribing for that until you know what those are. Um, so yeah, we have guys who might be spending an hour a day on mobility work, five or six days a week. We have guys that maybe spend 15 minutes on it three days a week because they really, they move very well throughout their entire body. And for them, it's more just, hey, let's get strong, let's get powerful, and let's reinforce good patterns on the mound. And then other guys, it's the complete opposite. We have, we have to place a ton of time on undoing some of these, these patterns and these restrictions that these guys have. Um, but yeah, at least, at least three days a week of mobility for basically everybody that we're working with, depending on what their issues are. All right, Nate asks, how do you recommend uh, how do you recommend lifting and throwing every day, or do you guys recommend it? I think he's asking, should you lift or throw every day, um, or is, is that too much? Um, again, the point is we're trying to we're trying to create a throwing and a lifting prescription that you can recover from week to week, and that it's creating and eliciting the adaptation or the benefit that you want. So if you are lifting six days a week and you, you measure everything, you realize your weights are going down, your recovery is getting worse, um, you're sore everywhere, uh, that would be an example of doing too much, you should probably cut back. But it's really not about, your question is about the frequency, how many days a week. Uh, it's, it's hard to look at it as just frequency because I could be lifting seven days a week but just doing one set of three reps on something at a light weight. And so in that case, uh, the frequency is very high, seven days a week, but the volume is very low. I'm only doing three reps seven days a week. I'm only doing 21 reps in the entire week. So it's not just about frequency. It's more about the overall volume over the course of the week, how many sets and reps you did at what intensity. And that's for lifting. That's also for throwing. You can't throw a max every bullpen every single day. Uh, but you could throw 20 pitches every single day. You could throw every day and recover more than fine. Uh, so it's, it's way more about balancing all these variables and making sure that you're recovering week to week. If you're not recovering, you probably need to do a little bit less. General rule of thumb, two upper body lifts, two lower body lifts, two high intensity throwing days per week. We don't really need to go beyond that in the off season phase. All right, so the next question comes from Baseball for a Living. Uh, he asks, how do you focus on thoracic rotation and what are ways to improve it? Uh, so I'll link to a couple exercises that we use uh, in the description, I'll also link to one of the assessments that we use, just so you guys can see that as well. Um, but it also depends a little bit on, are you missing passive thoracic rotation and active, or are you just missing active, active thoracic rotation? So something where you just lie on your back and you open up, that's passive. We're just seeing, does your thoracic spine open up? Does it have that range? Versus something where maybe you're on all fours and you have to actively fight against gravity 
to get into that position. Uh, you'd be surprised, some guys have the passive range, but they don't have active control over that range. So the prescription for somebody who's missing active control of that range is you know much activations we might use a little bit of band resistance uh or and or band assistance to help them get there and then have them hold that range so maybe a band to help get to the range and then we take the band away and they have to hold it um so for guys like that it's more activations frc type uh, modalities to regain active control of that range and for guys who are really just uh just kind of locked up through their t-spine it's it's kind of a we're attacking it from all sides with active and passive uh, different modalities uh, tissue work uh, sometimes there could be a joint actual joint restriction um, so sometimes it's not nearly as simple as just doing more rotational work uh, and sometimes we do uh, uh, we do refer guys out to you know a, ch a chiro or a therapist if they seem to have some sort of actual joint restriction uh, bony block that's restricting that rotation. So just keep that in mind as well. It's not always as easy as just cranking through rotation or cranking through thoracic cars and expecting it to get better, although that does help in most cases. Uh, different grips on the fastball and thumb placement. Uh, this comes from Adrian Marilla, who's one of our remote guys. So he's asking about basically where the thumb should be on the fastball. Uh, I don't have a good answer for you because that's dependent on what's most comfortable for you and what's, what gets you the best results. Uh, for me personally, I actually don't throw a four seam fastball at all because it just never felt comfortable in my hand and I would always throw the two seam harder. Now, if I had tested it, it felt uncomfortable, but it was harder than the two seam, I probably would have kept it and, and tried to work on it being more comfortable. But I would play around with four seam grips and two seam grips and between those, I would modify and play with your finger width. Uh, sometimes we'll see the two seam be extremely, be slower than it should be and a lot of times guys are throwing it almost like a fork ball like they're very wide with their finger position and so they're not getting that force directly through the back of the baseball and when we bring those fingers together we can more appropriately get that force straight through the the center and the back of the baseball so that's one thing to play with is your actual finger width and then whether it's a two seam or four seam but when it comes to thumb position that's again it's trial and error you're gonna have to play around with what actually works um, it's going to be dependent on your hand size so i don't have super big i have pretty big palms but my fingers aren't super long um, so for me it actually feels uncomfortable putting my thumb and tucking it under the ball but i know a lot of big leaguers do that i have no idea how that feels comfortable for them because of my fingers but a lot of big leaguers will tuck the thumb under there and that works for them for me it feels more comfortable having my thumb a little bit off to the side um, so you're honestly going to have to play around with what feels comfortable, but also, I talked about this in the last podcast, just get some objective numbers. Go out to a field, throw 50 throws at 70%, and five different sets of 10 using five slightly different finger positions and slightly different thumb positions. You should be able to settle on which one of those is most comfortable and which one gets you the most consistent uh, release point, consistent action, and where the velocity numbers uh, fluctuate or differ. Uh, so again, just kind of trial and error, same uh, kind of a generic answer, but that's the best answer I can give you because again, that's different for everybody. There's lots of big leaguers that do it one way, lots of big leaguers that do it another way. So, uh, so there you go. And then this is the final question we've got for today. Uh, Houston's Pitching asks, if I have a dead arm, can I still pitch during that time or do I shut down completely? Uh, I, uh, I did put out a Q&A about this uh, about a year ago, uh, so I'll see if I can find that, link that in the description for a little bit more information. Um, but dead arm is kind of a generic term, your arm just feels, your arm just doesn't feel lively. Um, it can in some cases be a precursor to, you might have, uh, might have a labor injury, you might have actual structural damage, and it's kind of that first warning sign. Uh, I did have a partial labor tear at one point that shut me, shut me down for a few months, uh, several years ago. And the precursor to that was a dead arm phase. There was about two or three weeks where my arm just didn't feel alive. Um, I ended up shutting down after that period for a week or two, just to give it some time to cover. I came back and it was still the exact same feeling. So if you do that, if you're not, you're for sure not overworked in your throwing workload, and you're for sure not being work, overworked in your lifting workload, you give it a little bit of time and it's still dead, that's not a great sign. There could be something going on uh, structurally or positionally in your shoulder uh, that you might need to address. Uh, but if it's just uh, a high workload, um, the most common thing, I would say 95% of the time that we hear guys have dead arm, 
they're just handling a high workload. They're throwing five or six days a week, and maybe they're doing two velocity days, and they're, maybe they're doing two moderate effort, day, effort days where they're supposed to be throwing it pretty light. Um, the most common issue is guys take their non-high intensity days too hard. Almost every case when guys are getting too much volume, it's not because they're throwing 15 innings that week in games or in inner squads or they're throwing 100 pitch bullpens. That's not usually what happens. Coaches can kind of see that and that's really obvious to not do. It's more when guys take their, their moderate effort day two days after a start and they're hucking it like 90% effort. Um, that's where you tend to accumulate a little bit too much volume is taking your recovery days at like 70% and taking your moderate days at like 85, 90%. And then obviously taking your max effort days max effort. Uh, most of the time it's those guys that have been cued, like intent is all that matters that they think they can't get a productive throwing session in unless, um, unless they go max effort. And so that just becomes the mentality every single session, every single day, recovery day. And the second we kind of intervene and tell them like, look, your recovery day is your recovery day. The point of it is to give your tissues uh, time to recover and heal, uh, give your nervous system a little bit of a break. And if you have to just toss a ball from 30 feet for five minutes, that's what you should do. That's where auto regulation comes in knowing your arm, knowing what it can handle, and knowing what it can recover from uh, is kind of the, the name of the game most of the time. But again, definitely uh, don't assume that's all it is. It definitely could be something more serious. So give it some time to recover. If it's still dead and it's still not, not giving you anything, um, it might be worth getting checked out just to rule out any sort of uh, labrum or uh, cuff pathology. So that being said, guys, uh, this is the end of episode three Q&A. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, you guys submitting a lot of questions this time around. Hopefully you found a lot of value through this. Uh, if you guys aren't already following us on social media, our Twitter is Tread Athletics. Our Instagram is Tread underscore Athletics. I post there pretty much daily, so definitely check us out there. And keep an eye out on both of those social media channels. We'll run a Q&A submission period a couple days before we film these. Um, and you can also comment below this video and we will check the comments before we film the next Q&A just to see what other questions you guys have. So uh, I really like this format and hope you guys uh, do as well just for being able to get a little bit more personalized and give you guys uh, more in-depth answers than you'd necessarily get in like a Facebook or a Twitter uh, reply or in like an Instagram uh, one story reply. So that's my goal here with Tread. If you guys are interested in individualized remote training, that is what we do as a company. We've got over 200 athletes. We've had 27 athletes drafted between 2017 and 2019. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that and to continue growing the remote company. So reach out to us at contact at treadathletics.com if you have questions specific to your situation, and we'll be happy to talk to you. But until then, guys, this is Ben Brewster. I'll see you guys next time.